Welcome to a brand new special, everyone. First of all, thank you all for the support you've shown thus far. As you'll recall, we didn't have a special for the 3000 subscriber milestone, because it happened so quickly after I'd released the previous celebration that I didn't want to flood your feeds with two tier lists back to back. So to make up for it, we'll make today's list a special one. Everyone loves the karaoke here, and considering the fact how music is my second biggest hobby next to gaming, this was a list I've been looking forward to making for quite some time. And it really was a difficult one to construct, I can tell you that much right now. So here's the deal. We'll be going through the various songs from the Yakuza series by release order of their respective games, and in the order the songs were represented in the karaoke con menu, but with a slight addendum. Since there are certain songs that were sung by different protagonists over the years, or just songs that received remixes with time, I will cover all of the song variations once we get to the very first use of the initial track. So, for example, I'll be ranking every single version of Machine Gun Kiss once we get to the karaoke songs from Yakuza 4, cause that was the game that introduced Machine Gun Kiss to the minigame. Also, there are certain songs absent from this particular list, so at the very end of the video I will do a speed round for all of the songs that may be missing, like Ichizu Samurai and Bakamitai from Ishin Kiwami. And since karaoke is a universally loved topic that will now be subject to criticism, let me preface all of this by saying each song here is genuinely amazing. Compared to most game OSTs, this entire tier list could firmly sit in S tier and it could be seen as an objectively correct assessment, but it wouldn't be much of a fun tier list, right? The point is, don't take any of these placements personally. I'm a metalhead, so you know that fast-paced heavy tracks in minor keys will be some of my undisputed favorites. There's a lot to unpack here, so let's start the tier list right away. First off, we have a batch of songs from Yakuza 3, the game that blessed us with this wonderful minigame. And at the risk of sounding very mean from the start, you can tell that this was their first attempt at writing such songs. Only one of the tracks is specific to Kiryu, and the rest follow a very standard J-pop formula befitting the time period, which makes them feel less distinct from the series' mainstays down the line. The first song, titled I Wanna Change Myself, is a good example of what I'm referring to. It's a safe, generic track in a major key that's uplifting and simple, and while the lyrics are written in a way where they could theoretically apply to anyone, they don't feel representative of Haruka herself, at least not during this time frame. The karaoke in Yakuza with time got this added dimension of depth, where many of the songs could only be sung by one of the protagonists, as the lyrics were tailor-made for their respective struggles in that very game. I Wanna Change Myself should set your expectations for most of the songs in Yakuza 3, because while it is a solid effort, it really pales in comparison to the other tracks that Haruka specifically has sung, especially when you look at her performances from Yakuza 5. So I'll put it in C tier. Next up, with the Sushi Jin anthem in all its glory, Kamurocho Lullaby. For being the first song Taylor made for Kiryu, they honestly did a phenomenal job here. It really fits that atmosphere of going out drinking solo and losing yourself in the Japanese nightlife. Kuroda-san's delivery is beautiful, as we rarely hear him singing in this particular register, and the solemn instrumental really felt like an indication of what the series could later do with tracks like Pure Loving Kamurocho or Bakamitai. Now, as much as I love this track, it's not an immediate S tier for me. With each entry here, I've looked at the full studio tracks from the official soundtrack releases, because the versions we hear in the minigame are deliberately made to be more rough sounding, with its production and general performances. And as I looked for the full version of Kamurocho Lullaby, I then found out that this song didn't have a full version. This is all there is to it, and while I do love all that is present, when you look at its composition, it feels more like a transition in a concept album than a fully fleshed out conventional song. It's like the composers found a beautiful poem and composed around it as is, without worrying about expanding on the golden bass we already had here. 
Basically, it just barely misses out on the S tier for me, cause it leaves me wanting to hear more of that emotion that's conveyed, and partially cause I want the higher tiers here to be more uniform by the end, which you'll see as the list progresses. Okay, out of the 4 remaining tracks from Yakuza 3, I'll tackle 3 of them at the same time, because they exhibit the same creative intention. Saturday Night Lover, Shooting Star and Summer Memories are all songs that sound like attempts at writing radio hits in the early to mid 2000s, even down to the production. If you're a fan of the TV series Hero, you'll know about a song called Can You Keep a Secret, which is a perfect example of what I think the composers wanted to encapsulate with these tracks. And while they do have different approaches in the intensity of the instrumentals, Generally, there's nothing that would distinguish these songs specifically as tracks from Yakuza, rather than your average J-pop you would hear on the radio back then. Mind you, I do enjoy some J-pop, but these tracks are way too safe, and don't have those impactful hooks that would later define the karaoke tracks in this franchise, both as great parts of the OSTs and great songs in their own right. As a result of the meteoric rise in quality we've had over the years, these three songs are just left feeling as humble beginnings more than anything else, and as such, will remain in C tier. Now, that's the reason why I didn't group this next track in with the other three. Because the song called Where Has Your Touch Gone feels like it lived up to the ideas the composers had in mind. Putting aside any narrative correlations with the hostesses, at face value, this song has strong memorable hooks which coupled with the arpeggiated segments on the keyboards, incites this sense of nostalgia, akin to the famous song I've mentioned earlier by Utada Hikaru. If you told me this was a radio hit in Japan, I'd definitely believe you, cause even though I do prefer heavier music, there's something uniquely ethereal about this track that makes it stand out among the other songs in Yakuza 3. It's still a safe composition, but it's a solid B tier that leaves you wondering what the next step for the karaoke in these games would be. And little did we know, we were already on the verge of something truly great. But before that, here we have the song Get to the Top. To avoid repeating what I've said about the group of tracks from Yakuza 3 so early, this song has a similar starting point, albeit with catchier and more deliberate melodies. At this point, it should be clear that I have somewhat of an aversion towards songs in major keys, i.e. overtly happy sounding material. But there are exceptions to that rule as well, which we'll see as the video continues. While I think this particular version is a solid C tier, the reimagining of it is something worth talking about. The masterpiece that is Yakuza Dead Souls saw it fit to grace the world with not just the first playable version of Majima, but also the first showcase of his singing abilities. Now, when it comes to Majima singing post Yakuza 0 in the timeline, there really are only two types of opinions aimed towards his karaoke performances. You're either someone who loves them to no end, or you're one of the people who consider these tracks a cacophony of incoherent screeching. Now, personally, I think his renditions are genius, and there's a lot of music theory that could solidify that. I've already mentioned how many of the tracks we've discussed so far feel formulaic, as you can easily guess what the exact chords and general melodies will be that will be utilized after a few seconds. These songs are designed to be more repetitive and in turn easily stuck in your head, but being memorable won't always make something good. And even if you hate Majima's rendition of Get to the Top, we can all agree that it is unexpected. A tornado of chaos to juxtapose the simple, repetitive basis. I've heard many people say how Majima was singing woefully off-key the entire time, but here's the thing. The song is tuned to a completely different key than Haruka's version to begin with, and Majima still sung it one octave lower as well, cause he has a lot more power in his lower register. But if you transpose both of the versions to the same key and play them over one another, You'll notice how Majima actually hits most of the notes correctly. It's just that he tends to slide around the desired notes at times, which gives it this chromatic feel once you isolate it. Kind of like playing on a fretless guitar, which gives it this really cool vibe in retrospect. 
even in the instances where he belts out seemingly arbitrary notes, you'd be surprised to learn that they're generally still part of the intended scale. Lastly, while the places where he decides to sing specific lyrics aren't accurate to the studio version by comparison, I genuinely think this actually works in the song's favor. This track has a very predictive rhythm and overt melodic repetition, so the fact that Majima changes them every single time makes the song feel fresh and keep you on your toes throughout. And it even gives off this polyrhythmic feel, but I know I've already spoken about this entry for far too long. So I'll just say, this is an S tier. If you're confused, listen to some prog, and you might actually wind up liking it later on. Okay, now this song, on the other hand, is an undisputed favorite of the community. The ever so charming Machine Gun Kiss, performed by three wonderful vocalists. Now, right off the bat, I'll state that when it comes to the songs on this list that have multiple vocal interpretations, I tend to treat the first appearance of a song as the standard by which the others are compared. In this instance, Kiryu's version of the track is canonically the first time this song was utilized in the series, and it makes for a great point of reference. The way I see it, Shinada and Adachi offer polar opposite takes on this song. While Adachi has an amazing vocal technique, you don't get the impression that he is really feeling the lyrics, if you catch my drift. Coincidentally, while Shinada does have a great voice, generally speaking, his performance is that of a person that's so in love that he doesn't care as much about hitting every note flawlessly on a technical level. Now, most Yakuza fans tend to agree that Shinada's version is indeed the weakest of the three, which I don't think is very fair. For one thing, a point that is often overlooked with these performances is that Adachi's version specifically sounds more like it's the voice actor trying to do his own take on the track rather than him singing it as the character he portrays. What do I mean by that? Well, for 90% of this track, Adachi has none of that notable rasp which defines his voice performance throughout the game, with the only exception being the very end where he belts out the final lyrics, and even though it is impressive from a technical standpoint, it completely misses the point of the song. Like, imagine someone serenading you through these lyrics, only to end the song by screaming FALL IN LOVE in your face. It, it just doesn't fit for me. On the other hand, Shinada sounds exactly as you would expect from his voice performances in the cutscenes of the main story, which is something he rarely gets praise for. And what about Kiryu's version? If Adachi is all about technique and Shinada is all about emotion, then Kiryu is the perfect blend of the two. His delivery is phenomenal and it genuinely embodies the sincerity behind the lyrics with a powerful yet oddly gentle drive at the same time. While all of these performances are S-tier material for me, Machine Gun Kiss has always been tied as my favorite song for the franchise, so I wanted to say everything that was on my mind to properly address it. Next up, Maiden Colored Life. At the risk of sounding overtly short compared to the other entries I've spoken about, this song once again falls into that generic possible grade as the other songs that follow its style, making it a C tier for me. Frankly, the only reason why this song somewhat stands out in my mind is its reimagining from Yakuza Kiwami, that being Auto Metal My Life. For the longest time, this was treated as the hardest karaoke song in the series and a notable roadblock to anyone who went for the coveted Kiwami Platinum. If you thought playing it on proper hardware was hard enough to get a great score, try doing it on a laptop that could barely run Kiwami on the lowest settings. Even with my musical background, there were a lot of things that made me have to replay the song to get that desired score and finish off Haruka's infernal requests. So maybe it's because of that unplanned repetition hammering the song's rhythm into my memory that I actually wound up enjoying this song more than I ever thought I could. It's basically a track you could expect from here from a band like Baby Metal, on their debut album. Cutesy vocals with a furious double bass and a decent amount of distortion. It has this weird sense of infamy in the community, like Mahjong of all things, that makes the more cynical side of me chuckle. Cause we've all been through the strange experience that is this track, and can now hopefully laugh about its effects on our general enjoyment of the game as well. 
So I'll give it a generous low A tier. Next up, we have one of the best love songs that this franchise has introduced, Pure Love in Kamurocho, with three entries separated based on their respective male leads. So we have the version with Akiyama and Hana, one with Kiryu and your hostess of preference, and finally, Ryuji's performance from Yakuza Dead Souls. Now, let's be completely objective. Based on pure technical skill and emotion in the delivery, Akiyama is easily the best vocalist in this series, and this is coming from a diehard fan of Takaya Kuroda and the Goodfellas. But most importantly with Akiyama, you can actually tell it's his character doing the singing, because there's still this underlying distortion sprinkled in some of his melodies, albeit fairly dialed down, and he sticks to the range that defines his regular speaking voice all throughout the track. His voice actor has amazing vocal control that makes a clear distinction between this role and the other songs he has done for different IPs. With Kiryu's version, while it does sound beautiful, you can tell that these notes aren't as comfortable for him to hit compared to his iconic lower register. It still sounds in character, especially when you consider Kiryu's earliest vocal performances in the franchise, but his delivery here sounds a lot more fragile than he may have intended for it to be. And not to discredit the hostesses accompanying him, but when you hear Hana's vocals, anything else pales by comparison. As for Ryuji, it is an honest, manly effort. It's the version of the song that I've listened to the least, but that's more so because Akiyama put the bar insanely high up. Nevertheless, I'd genuinely love to hear more songs with Ryuji at the helm, if the opportunity presents itself, because I think he could do wonders with a song designed around his unique gravelly vocal style. One more thing about Akiyama's version. His connection to the hostess lifestyle in Kamurocho and his implied relationship with Hana really makes the lyrics come to life even more. So, because of all of that, their version goes to S tier, Kiryu's goes to A, and Ryuji's goes to B. Up next, we have yet another song with Hana at the forefront, Raindrops. I feel that this song is one more example of the 2000s J-pop soundscape actually being done right. Granted, a lot of it has to do with Hana's flawless performance and more melancholy melodies, but even on a fundamental level, this track just has, in my opinion, stronger and more cohesive examples of songwriting that really do this style justice. It gives off the same vibes as the song Tempesto by Miyano Mamoru, and that's a huge positive from my perspective. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out one specific version of Raindrops, that being the version from Dead Souls, where Mr. Orewa Majima does some of the funniest backing vocals in the whole series. I was genuinely crying of laughter when I heard him sing what basically translates to I am Majima over and over again as the poor hostess looked to the camera in horror. <laughs> anyway, uh, Raindrops gets a solid A tier from me. Oh, well, what do you know? Another Majima-related song. This time, we're talking about Majima no Majirok from Kurohyo 2. I'll immediately say that this is an S tier, and no matter how much I may try to sing this song's praise, no pun intended, you really need to check it out for yourselves to see why that is. Not only is this one of the rare songs post-zero where Majima is fully serious about hitting the quote-unquote intended notes by the composer, this song also has some of the most unique button prompts of this minigame to date, sometimes requiring combo prompts with 1 plus 2 inputs, and having a colorful UI that makes your eyes dot all around the screen, this is one of the coolest things to come out of the Kurohyo series. And if you know how much I love those spin-offs, then you know that's something truly special. Also, this is one of the few songs that actually got a dedicated music video for it, which was bundled in with a special edition of the game. It's bizarre, menacing, and fits the quote-unquote good old PS3 version of Majima exceptionally well. Check it out if you find the time. Well, it's time to address the motorcycle in the sewer. Uh, I mean, the elephant in the room. If you know Yakuza, you will know this song, the ever so memed on Baka Mitai. A song that took the meme world by storm for a moment, and with time, but several unique versions across a number of games. 
We have four versions here, sung by Kiryu, Saijima, Akiyama, and Namba. Now, while most of the community has undoubtedly gotten sick of the song from the overexposure it got in its heyday, let's be real here, it's still a good song. It became an inseparable part of Yakuza's identity for a reason. As for the versions listed here specifically, Saijima's is arguably the weakest, but still a solid take on it. By the time I got to Yakuza 5, ironically, the game that introduced the song, I was fairly burnt out on it, since I played the games in order of the timeline. But with his version, it's more of an issue that his vocal style doesn't fit the studio version sung by one of the series' composers, but I'll elaborate on that once we reach a different track he sings on. Namba, on the other hand, has the exact same problem as Adachi, with the performance having little to no resemblance to Namba's actual voice, both in register and the level of distortion. Don't get me wrong, his seiyuu has a beautiful voice, and it takes an extraordinary amount of talent to mirror a unique character's inflection and tone to make sure it works in a musical sense as well. And I still genuinely think that this is a great version of the song to listen to in a casual setting, but I had to point that bit out regardless. Meanwhile, with Akiyama, as you'd expect, he gives a stellar performance, arguably the strongest when we're talking about the traditional version of the instrumental we're so used to hearing. And I feel that that's something to take note of, because, in my humble opinion, the best version of Bakamite is one that is rarely, if ever, given its time in the spotlight. I'm genuinely glad that the artwork for Kiryu's version has him wearing his classic grey suit, because the acoustic rendition of the song from Yakuza Kiwami is one that caught me off guard in the most beautiful way. The simple but impactful string arrangement really makes the song live up to the subtitle of Sorrow that this version holds, but most importantly, the final chord of the song was changed, which essentially altered the song's entire meaning. The original version we're so used to hearing actually ends on a major chord, which indicates a hopeful resolution of the song's story, and in turn, it actually contradicts the final visual of the associated cinematic, ironically enough. Yet in Kiwami's version, the song ends on a minor chord, effectively doubling down on the implied lament and sadness of the experience the song describes. It's an experience that stays with you for quite a while, which I found to be much more impactful and befitting the spirit that the song used to carry before the internet turned it into this so-called dame dame, literacy be damned. Final rankings. Kiryu, S tier. Saijima, B tier. Akiyama, S tier. And Namba, A tier. Now, we have a selection of tracks courtesy of Haruka's idol career in 5, and the first track on the list is, oddly enough, the last song that we learn for her performances. It's the song called Because I Have You. I don't really have that much to say on this one, as it's my second least favorite song in this part of the game that I genuinely enjoyed otherwise. The only song I'd rank lower is the ironically themed Dream that plays during the climax of the story. Seeing as how Because I Have You was introduced fairly late in her segments of Yakuza 5, I didn't grow attached to it as some of the other tracks, though I do prefer it to many of the other happy-sounding, upbeat tracks, so I'll put it in B tier. Meanwhile, Loneliness Loop quickly became one of my favorite tracks in the entire franchise. Maybe I'm just a sucker for sad songs that still sound catchy, but this one stood out to me as soon as the first few notes played out. It has these passages I would sometimes hear in melodic metalcore songs that dropped in the mid-2000s, which is a huge plus for me. And seeing as how I play the guitar as well, the track's stronger guitar focus is another phenomenal addition, as there are some really tasteful leads here. At this point, I would just be repeating myself if I went more in-depth on why I like songs with this type of atmosphere, so I'll just say it's an easy S-tier, and one of the highlights of my many playthroughs of Yakuza 5 as a whole. And now we've come to the poster song of the idol narrative, the ever-so-memed-on so much more. Based on my persistent remarks on quote-unquote happy generic J-pop, you'd think I'd probably tear this song to shreds or just quickly shrug it off. But surprisingly enough, much like with Otometal, the prolonged exposure to this track made me look at it more analytically, 
and genuinely consider it as one of the standout tracks of the series on its own merits. Again, this is the quintessential Haruka song for most people, and putting aside the conflicting motivation behind her joining the idol world in the first place, this track fits the unshakable optimism that defined the more recent versions of her character. And coupling it with the countless memes of big muscular dudes chanting in support of this chipper song, you can't help but enjoy it, ironically or not. And that's something worthy of praise, at the very least. Okay, next up, we have Ring. A pretty strange song now that I think of it. Mainly because, even as I wrote my general thoughts for this song at first, for whatever reason, I genuinely couldn't remember a single note of it. But then, as soon as I played the few seconds to remind myself, I immediately went, Oh, it's that one! I love that song! And that's something that kept happening with this specific track whenever I would go over the song titles in the karaoke catalog. My brain just refuses to associate the song Ring with the title Ring, which is just hilarious to me. And now that I look at all of the different versions we got, I immediately realize that the reason for that is the horribly imbalanced mix that you get in the actual karaoke minigames. Normally, these abridged songs are meant to sound more rough around the edges, with occasional imperfections in the vocal performances, because that would really hammer home the idea of it being a live take. But once you listen to the studio version, the one where the always wonderful Yuki takes center stage, it makes the song shine in a brand new light. After listening to it for a few times in a row, and still remembering it by the end, I think this is a solid A tier, all thanks to her amazing performances here. And to cap off the songs introduced in Yakuza 5, we have Rouge of Love, a song that most people probably first heard in Yakuza 0, and frankly, a song that probably fits that time frame a lot better, if you ask me. Something about it just makes me think of the 80s rather than the 2010s in terms of memorable pop music, but there isn't that much to add here beyond that. It's a cool track that I enjoy listening to, but there's a number of hostess tracks I found to be more memorable in the long run. So let's go with B tier. And now we have a nice change of pace. Before there was the Kiryu rap from Like a Butterfly, there was Ryoma's Samurai Swagger. I have quite a soft spot for Ishin's OST, and this track is no exception. Kana's operatic delivery makes it sound like the perfect conclusion to an epic historical drama, the song that caps off a lengthy war with a clean swipe of a sword. Beyond that, the music really embodies the noble nature of this time frame in Japan's history exceptionally well. While the lyrics allude to an uncertain, ever so tragic love story, and the combination of those two makes for exactly the type of love songs that set the series apart from its contemporaries, perhaps even further than before. Simply put, this is an A tier. Okay, now this song is one that really grew on me with time. It's the song called Kokyo ni Nishiki wo Kazarubesh, sung by Saejima's Ishin counterpart, Nagakura Shinpachi. When I talked about Ryuji singing in Pure Love and Saejima singing in Bakamitai, I alluded to the fact that their specific vocal styles don't really fit with songs that rely on clean and subtle vocal delivery. You need to play to your individual strengths. And these two are defined by vocals whose level of distortion would make even Phil Anselmo blush. So the fact that Saejima got a song written around his raspy voice finally allowed for his strengths to really shine. His performance in this song is amazing, and the unique instrumental has this undeniable historical feel with some tasteful contemporary flavors thrown in for good measure, and it all works wonderfully. This is a really strong A tier, and I'd highly recommend listening to the full version that was auto-generated by YouTube, because the trumpet solo in the middle is one of the finest moments on these OSTs. In fact, the only reason that this is not in S tier is that I have far too many favorites in the series, so I have to draw the line somewhere. Oh wait, one more thing, Shinpachi's jump scare face at the end. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And then you... <laughs> and then you take into account the almost off-key backing vocals that Yoma does, just... Yes, I love this series. <laughs> Beautiful. Next up, 
probably the first Ishin song that the Western audience became familiar with, thanks to its reimagining in Yakuza Kiwami. Here we have Iji Zakura. This is the only song where Ryoma takes center stage, and much like Ashura Komachi before it, the instrumentation here has this noble spirit to it, amplified by the unified voices of the many people singing backing vocals to Ryoma's stellar performance. It feels epic, even though the lyrical matter delves into the equivalent of that farmer meme from a while back, but with some good old Yakuza charm sprinkled on, you really have the makings of an epic track. As for the remix, I love it even more, because it really gives off these nice subtle Visual K vibes, with the keyboard segments really reminding me of Utsusemi by The Gazette, and the more upbeat drums basically feel like early 1OK rock. Hell, I even recorded a brief acoustic cover of it on Twitter. I think both of these versions deserve an A tier, easily. And now, we have a performance by the canonically most beautiful man of the Bakumatsu era, Okita Soji with the song Samurai Ondo. Since this is a quote-unquote wacky Majima song, most of my old praise and thoughts still apply here. Perhaps even more than with any other track, this song and the associated visuals just make you wanna dance. And I usually hate dancing, but this song is just too good, let's be real. Also, Okita forgetting the lyrics halfway through, even in the full studio version, always makes me burst out laughing. This song is literally what you would expect to hear from a night out with the boys after you go through a few beers. And I'm all for it. S tier. Well, here we are, at the song that rebirthed the series in the West. Yakuza Zero. The first track, Sunshine. Eh, I mean... <laughs> it, it feels kind of weird starting off this segment with an entry like this, because you can definitely guess what I'll say by this point. Blah blah, major key, happy, upbeat, blah blah blah. Look, if there are any fellow musicians who have a refined palette and find tracks like this one to be some of the finest in the OSTs, please feel free to share your thoughts on it, because while I can certainly appreciate the effort, it's fairly evident that this broad approach that is exhibited just isn't my thing. Though, I will say, the fact that Yuki also sings on this track definitely elevates the song for me. Especially in this game, she's just a ball of sunshine. I can make anything sound better by just being there. Still, this is only a B tier for me. I'm sorry, but at the very least, we can all agree that Yuki is still best girl. Next up, 24 Hour Cinderella. This song is part of the big three of sorts for me. Back when Yakuza Zero was making the rounds and the world just found out about the wonders of karaoke, Three tracks resulted in the strongest reaction from the public, those being Bakamitai, for obvious reasons, Judgment, being Kiryu's favorite track in the game, and finally Cinderella, as Majima's go-to song. Even though this song's structure is fairly standard, Majima's performance makes it feel like a legitimate 80s classic. This was sung before he adapted his Mad Dog persona, and before his reckless abandon for, well, conventional singing, I guess. Majima's voice actor has even gone on record saying how he doesn't like singing that much, so the fact that he did such a phenomenal job here, whether you're a casual music fan or someone who dissects a track note for note, makes this song hold a very special place in my heart. I'm sure we all remember that first time when the cinematic transition hit, and it strongly reaffirmed how this was a one-of-a-kind series with a one-of-a-kind community. S tier. Now, I may not have actually said this up to this point, but I do have a soft spot for music from the 80s too. A majority of the bands that were my gateway into music made their mark on the world during that decade, and because of that, even just a production that is tied to the 80s is one that immediately elevates a song for me. Heartbreak Mermaid is as 80s as it gets, and it's an all-around fun track, making it an easy A tier for me. But then there's also the quote-unquote remix to consider. While I wouldn't consider any of the songs on this list to be bad or even genuinely mediocre on a grander scale, the remix to Mermaid is easily my least favorite. Mumen de la Petite the song whose pronunciation I've butchered beyond belief, is a song that does away with the 80s aesthetic that defined the original, 
and instead opted for a more time-relevant approach for Kiwami's setting. But then, when you take that original atmosphere away and try to blend the composition with the basic dance vibes of the 2000s, you're ultimately left with an awfully generic sounding song that feels like a rejected B-side from the karaoke tracks in Yakuza 3. I generally adore music from the 2000s, even if it's in no way related to rock, but this particular song just feels hollow by all accounts. And yet, I'd rather listen to this than most of the top-charting pop songs today, which says quite a lot. So, C tier it is. Ah, here is the song that is eternally tied for first place with Machine Gun Kiss for me. A true masterpiece of the 80s. Judgment feels like the perfect blend of the material Ronnie James Dio did on his own, with a touch of good old visual K from a band like Nightmare. I've sung this song so many times, I've played it on the guitar, the drums, and while all of those attempts were undoubtedly awful, I've yet to become sick of this song and all it represents. And I've listened to it around a hundred times by now. It's a track that could be a real gateway to rock and metal for newcomers, akin to something like Enter Sandman. It feels iconic, even without delving into the depth and relevance that the lyrics of Judgment have for the story of Yakuza 0. If you want to shed even more tears after finishing that game, and perhaps Yakuza Kiwami as well, please look up a translation of these lyrics. If you didn't see this song as an S tier before that, you surely will after. Continuing with the theme of shedding tears, oh god, why is that right next to each other? Here we have the only full new song from Yakuza Kiwami to accompany the various remixes. With the inseparable ties between the stories of Yakuza 0 and Kiwami, and with the amount of attention put on the relationship between Kiryu and Nishiki, this song's lyrical theme made perfect sense to accompany a retelling of the story that started the franchise. Now, Nishiki is one of my favorite characters in the series, so it might sound surprising how I wouldn't put this song into S tier right away. Don't get me wrong, lyrically, it's a 10 out of 10 would cry again. But the musical approach is the thing that somewhat irks me. You'll remember how I've used terms like minor and major all throughout the video, so let me finally explain it for anyone who may have not been acquainted with those terms. A song in a major key frequently sounds positive and uplifting, while minor keys indicate sadness and complex emotions. Considering the events of Yakuza Kiwami, from an artist's perspective, I understand why the composers would use lyrics dealing with lament to juxtapose a quote-unquote happy or hopeful instrumental, even if it is a slower-paced one. In theory, these polar opposite elements should actually work together quite well, but once you realize how the imagery is exclusively Nishiki from the good old days, and then you see Kiryu still singing the song in Kiwami 2 and Yakuza 6, it just makes you feel even more depressed than it may have been intended. I get that that's the point, in a way, and that Kiryu is still grieving over the loss of his brother, but if even the imagery indicates that Kiryu longs for those good old days, it would have been a stronger choice if, after Kiwami wrapped up, we got a stripped-down acoustic version of Judgment to sing along to, with maybe a string arrangement mirroring Nishiki's melodic parts. Sticking to that song would have reinforced the idea of honoring who Nishiki really was, instead of lamenting how we failed to prevent what he had become. What this is, is a very long way of justifying putting tonight into A tier, and not S in the end. Alright, next up in release order are the songs from Yakuza 6. And honestly, this might have been one of my favorite selections of songs to date, cause most of them are brand new and all of them are outstanding. So to start off, we have Hands, probably the longest karaoke song to date, which is amazing in and of itself. Normally, you'll have around a minute and a half of a track to play along to, with the full versions being exclusive to OST releases. But here, you play through the whole thing in one go, and this song, perhaps even more than the most recent karaoke tracks, genuinely feels like it was purposefully written by the individual singing it. People have said how it also sounds like an anime opening, and I agree. It's an amazing J-Rock track that reflects the positivity of the Hirose family and Onomichi as a whole. Well, if you disregard the whole Onomichi secret business, but yeah. Love the song, 
Asteroides. Aha! Welcome to Evanescence Meets Paramore, the song. Even if you aren't familiar with Like a Butterfly, you will definitely recognize Kiryu's iconic shades right away. I think this is a phenomenal song, because, like I said a millisecond ago, it feels like an Evanescence track, specifically off an album like Fallen, but mixed with the more upbeat emo nature of early Paramore, and it just flows beautifully. For this tier list, we only have two versions present, based on the person who does the rap part in a given game. So there's Kiryu's take and Ichi's take. And as much as I love Ichi's enthusiasm and Eddie's smooth voice, that version of Like a Butterfly pales in comparison to the versions with Kiryu. Putting our pitchforks and waifu preferences aside, I'd argue that the single best performance of this song is the one with Kiryu and Kirara Asuka from Kiwami 2. At the time when I played that game, I was still generally paying attention to each individual hostess's narrative, and the added context really put into perspective how this song feels tailor-made for Kirara, even though it was actually written during Yakuza 6's development. Though the main reason why I think this is the best version is her vocal performance. Out of all of the hostesses, you can tell that she has the best control of her voice, shown in her smooth yet concise ascending notes in the chorus and the vocal cry sprinkled all throughout the song. Apparently, she was once a part of an idol group, so the technical prowess makes sense. But the fact that her ability doesn't overshadow the intended emotion of the song, plus the fact that she sings the song in its original key, makes this specific version an S tier for me. As for the version from 7, I'll have to put it in B tier, just based off the fact how I've almost never revisited any of the other versions of this song. Don't get me wrong, I still love this duo and I'm genuinely glad that we saw them pal around with this specific track. This is just stylistic preference more than anything. The last piece from Yakuza 6 is another song that achieved a notable meme status pretty quickly. Today is a diamond. So, remember what I said about songs like Tonight, where we're mixing depressing lyrics with a major key? Well, this is an example of it working out just right for me. Part of the reason for that is that, at face value, the lyrics just tell a simple story of a married couple on vacation. It's only after you really look into the lyrics that it takes on a grimmer meaning, which is also a nice metaphor for Onomichi as a whole. Seemingly being a nice, peaceful small town, but actually harboring many dark secrets beneath. Plus, I unironically love everything about this song, which, as you can tell, is a rarity for me when we're talking about songs in major keys. S tier. Fittingly enough, here's yet another song with a similar sentiment in its composition, one that we usually just call Shiava Senara. Yet again, we have a coupling of lyrics portraying lament and instrumentals portraying hope. But the thing that really sells this song, and vastly sets it apart from its other stylistic accomplices in the franchise, is Majima's vocal performance. By this point, he has made the Mad Dog persona his home, so to speak. He's chaotic in the eyes of everyone but his closest associates, and even then it's a common sentiment. But the people he keeps around know that the now secret, serious side of him, that was prominently featured in Yakuza 0, is still there perhaps feeling even more lonesome than ever before. Majima starts singing this song like a true mad dog, snapping into his chaotic delivery much like he's done with Get to the Top or his usual backing vocals. But the best part about it is how, as the song progresses, you see the cracks in this mask he carries. He lets his sorrowful side out, that side that only his most trusted allies still remember, and he shares it with every player who delved into the Majima saga. The latter half of the song is sung exactly as its composer had first envisioned it to be, juxtaposing these two extremes of his personality with one another and portraying it through the lens of him knowing Makoto actually got to live a nice life after everything they've been through and all of that time that has passed is all we could have hoped for from this little saga of his. They're both alive and wound up being surrounded by people who love them for who they are. It's a nice little bow to their relationship, whatever you'd like to label it as. On the flip side, we have Zetsubocho Pride, a badass way of saying you can rise above anything. 
so it's fitting that both Kiryu and Majima contribute to this track. Even this early in the timeline, they've gone through hell and countless hardships, so if the two of them can rise up above it, then anyone could do it. According to this track, all you really need to do it is one supportive, yet swift, kick in the ass. And that's exactly what this song is. It's dripping with 2000s rock vibes, perfectly fitting the story's time frame, that being 2006. It's very riff-driven and makes you bang your head right away. And don't get me started on the infectious chants in the chorus. This is a high A tier for me, cause as much as I may gush over this track, there's something I can't really put into words that's missing from it and separating it from the other classics. Maybe it's the fact it hasn't reappeared since Kiwami 2, maybe it's because this song wasn't picked up by the meme enthusiast council of the internet, or that the cinematic doesn't feature Kiryu and Majima jumping around the stage like the lovable goofs that they are. But this song just barely misses out on S tier. And even then, it's just so, so fun to listen to. Just check out Kuroda-san's live take of the song and I'm sure you'll love it too. And now, we have finally arrived at the songs introduced in Yakuza 7. First off, Hell Stew. So, if you're not familiar with the Japanese music scene, I'm guessing most Westerners thought that the costumes that were presented here were an homage to the band KISS. But really, this is a clear nod to Seikimai and their theatric take on classic J-metal and power metal. Yet, based on the few tracks that I've heard from them, the aesthetics are seemingly the only influence the composers took, cause this song is a polar opposite of that blend of rock and metal. This song is Pride from Despair's instrumental on steroids, with a vocal delivery going more for a dark mood rather than pounding energy. Between Ichiban's and Zhao's take, we've seen two equally interesting perspectives on that melodic delivery, though Zhao's take is really out of this world. His character already has that devious but playful side bleeding through, and the fact that he seamlessly blends vibrato-filled belts with gravelly, unhinged undertones makes this performance live up to the associated imagery in the best possible way. This is essentially a modern judgement in terms of the epic factor for a brand new generation of heroes, and they knocked it out of the park. Ichi's version goes into A tier, and Zhao's goes to S. Next up, we have Psycho's song, Spring Breeze. Now, let me preface this by saying, Uesaka Sumire being cast in Yakuza 7 was a strike of genius. I was already aware of her anime appearances, and I thought she really deserved more exposure. And her voice? She's one of the many vocalists who mainly sticks to a generally higher pitch in her most notable solo work. Mind you, this particular technique she uses is one that I've heard countless times before, and I feel that it can be very easily fumbled. Yet, regardless of the occasion, she always manages to pull it off flawlessly. This song was initially a strong B tier for me, but after I'd gone back and listened to some of her solo work, like Love Crazy or the opening to Pop Team Epic, the fact she showcased a bit more of her slightly lower register made me appreciate it a lot more than before. Even if the chorus sounds exactly like the opening to Your Lie in April, but in a major key, Psycho's delivery still elevates this to an A tier. Lastly, before we go into the speed round, we have Ichiban's solo song, The Future I Dreamed Of. A beautiful, acoustically driven song where the key change in the chorus actually works wonders. Yes, you heard that right. This was an amazing call. And it paints the song in an even more hopeful and colorful light than the lyrics had already shown it to be. Originally, I was going to give this song a strong A tier, for the sake of somewhat balancing out this woefully imbalanced tier list. But this is Ichi's first song, and he's singing his heart out there. So, just this once, I'll bump it up to S tier. Who knows, maybe in a decade, when we look back on a lengthy collection of games solely from the Ichiban saga, we'll look back on this very track and remember all the lovable, hope-filled themes it radiated with as much nostalgia as the greatest songs this series has given us. Only time will tell, right? And now for the speed round. Muppet from Kurohyo, a licensed edition that is a god-tier track with some of the most bizarre input logic, 
because all you really need to do is viciously mash the circle button, no matter what the timing, and you'll get the high score in this karaoke minigame. It's so bafflingly random that I can't help but love it. So, S tier. Euro de Sunshine. This would be a high C to a low B tier. It doubles down on the energy of the original track with the added keyboards, but it's just an okay song overall. Brand new stage. I was genuinely surprised not to see this song on the list. Strong A tier. It has those nostalgic high school anime vibes that work really well with Yakuza 6's more uplifting moments. Fork in the Road, B tier. The verse is very formulaic, but the chorus is really good and driving. Harapeko Biori, A tier. Even if this were a C tier track, Ryoma's backing vocals of just saying Haruka, Haruka are some of the finest in the series. In general, the more traditional instrumentation gives this song a lot more room to breathe than your average track that's meant to be a joyful clap along. It's surprisingly good. Ichizu Samurai, S tier. Well, evidently I can't really show you the visuals cause, you know, YouTube. But the fact that this song not only has live action cinematics, which is a first for the series, but also had the audacity to become the single hardest karaoke song in the franchise's history overnight is mind-blowing. This was a song exclusive to Ishin Kiwami, and the composers really didn't pull any punches. It was apparently so hard on release that one of the many post-launch patch notes was issued specifically to make the inputs more forgiving, and that should really say something. Though, I did play the unpatched version as well, so... If you think that that was hard, please stay as far away from the original Ishin's Buya dancing. And of course, the most fitting way to end the tier list like this. Bakamitai in Ishin. Even after all this time, all the memes, all the different versions, this rendition stands out really well. The shamisen, the wind instruments, and the subtle arpeggiated segments work wonders in making this song feel like it was really intended for Ishin all along, and that's not an easy thing to do. Just remember what I've said about some of the Kiwami remixes of older karaoke tracks. The fact that it actually works in this context is as much of a surprise to me as it may be to you. And if I had to give it a ranking, even though this song has been overused to death, I would still put it in a high A tier overall. Perhaps even a low S. So, remember how I said I wouldn't put all of the songs into S tier? Well, planning ahead was never my strong suit. If the fact that I've recorded a video of this length has included you in, I can get a little carried away when it comes to the things that I love. But at the end of the day, this is just my personal list. Whether or not you agree with it, I would genuinely love to hear what your favorites are, and I'll leave a comment to the tier list in the description so you can give it a go yourselves. As for future videos or subscriber milestones on the channel, voice your thoughts and wishes, like always. To the people who subscribed, or are perhaps even members of the channel already, I can't thank you enough. And I genuinely hope you enjoyed the ride so far. I hope we'll have many more of these special occasions in the future. So, until that time comes, take care of yourselves and have a fantastic day. Cheers!